Indeed, he lives. And thank you, Brother Claire, for leading our worship this morning. Uh, isn't it good just to be gathered just to praise God? Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know, this is Easter Sunday, but every Sunday is special because of what happened, what we recognize on this particular Sunday out of the year. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, and we can praise God for that. We can take that with us every single day of our lives, can't we? And what a, an assurance, what a uh, strength, and what a positive thing. Just the knowledge of the promise is, let alone experiencing God at work in our life and His presence in our life. That just takes it to a whole other level. So we just want to worship and praise this morning. And as we do so, I just encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 20. Gospel of John chapter 20. You know this passage well. So I want to focus on some key words in uh, the first eight verses. The resurrection is a proven fact. You, you might have thought, well, no, it's just written about, but it happened so long ago. How could we ever really prove it? But it is really a, a proven fact. Fact, And it can be proven in different ways. First of all, there's the psychological evidence of changed lives. Then, now, and everything in between then and now. How many millions of lives have been changed by a risen Savior? You know, you ask me how, I know He lives. He lives within my heart. How many people have been able to say, just look at what happened to the um, apostles after the resurrection, would they have given up everything? Would they have gone uh, to the ends of their earth as they knew it and faced the dangers that they faced, the death that they faced, and all that it took with the joy and conviction if they hadn't seen the risen Lord? Absolutely would not have. There is the evidence of all the lives that changed. People who uh, didn't see the actual resurrection appearances. Peter writes about those. Uh, he says to the people that he originally addressed his letter to, you haven't seen, but you still believe, and your lives are changed, and they're different because of that. There are legal standards. You know they've actually proven it in the sense of a court of law type setting. This happened. Medical and forensic evidence verifies what happened. The testimony of friend and foe toward the resurrection of Jesus because there was a cover-up, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, they tried to uh, come in. And, and they, they all testify to the same reality. And you know that all the attempts to discredit the resurrection of Christ have been disproven. That's interesting. None of them have been able to withstand scrutiny. Fraud was impossible, not with this number of people, so many of them who had... Uh, once again, they were the foes. They had actually a reason to not believe it. And all of that is good and nice, but we also, as believers, know that the moral evidence of the Scripture, just what the Word of God says, is greater than all of those other things that we've mentioned. Skeptics refuse the idea, but we are not the jury or the judge who need to give a verdict. The verdict has been given. Jesus is risen, just as he said. He is alive. He did not temporarily escape the death penalty only to die again later. He lives forever and cannot ever die again. And it simply falls to human beings to accept or reject the verdict, which has already been given, which has already been proven, which has already been established. And to think about what the ramifications are of such a decision. Well, I want to invite you to see the events through the eyes of the beloved disciple. Most of us believe, most people have believed that uh, John is the beloved disciple. He just simply, in a, an act of humility, refused to identify himself in the gospel that uh, he was carried along by the Holy Spirit to write. And in John chapter 20, if you found that and are able to stand in honor of the reading of God's word this morning. What verse? Uh, we'll start at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. 
So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent in and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. Almighty God, Lord, as we come before you today, I just stand in awe of your plan of salvation. <clears throat> And what it must have been like on that morning as the earth sang its praises to feel your presence once again upon it. For you to come back from having defeated sin, death, and hell to have stood in absolute victory over the grave is a mighty act all in itself. But that you would call us let us, man, that you are mindful of us. You would call us to share in your victory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you for it. You are risen indeed. And may we declare among the nations that you reign. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Amen. John was a witness to the resurrection. There were others, certainly, many others that the scripture even uh, tell us about, and some of whom their story is also <laughs> included in the scripture. There would be more that could be written, uh, but we uh, certainly wouldn't want to tote around a Bible that large to contain just the stories of those who saw the resurrected Jesus, let alone everything else that he did during his ministry. I just want to focus on John. There's something interesting in the vocabulary in this chapter. And uh, most of us re realize that the original uh, manuscripts, the, the uh, original writing of the scripture was in the native language of the day. It was called Common Greek. Common Greek because that's what most everyone could read and write, or at least understand. It was the uh, major language of the Mediterranean world. And that is just like the Lord to put His <coughs> Word in the most readily accessible format that He possibly could because God desires that all should be saved and how can they be saved unless they hear the Word of Christ. And so He put it in a format that uh, people could understand. Well, we translate it into English and uh, there's a word here for seeing. And it's one English word repeated. But there are three different words originally. You see, John uh, saw, first he heard a message that sounded too good to be true. Maybe the first time you heard about the gospel, it was a message that was too good to be true to you. Mary has seen the unsealed tomb. And from the very first verses of this chapter, she realizes that the body is not there. The body of the Lord that she had seen, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, after the <coughs> immediate preparations had been done, they placed that body in a tomb, and it was sealed. They knew where it was. They knew uh, that it belonged uh, to uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and they recognized that Christ had had his body placed there. They come this Sunday morning. It was still dark, and the several ton stone has been rolled back in an uphill groove um, to its original place. And the Roman seal that had been placed on that tomb has been broken. And the many guards that had been ordered on the threat of death that they failed in their duty are no longer there. And she doesn't understand what's happening and comes back. And she tells the disciples, we don't know where Jesus is. And isn't that the response of the world? <laughs> we don't know where Jesus is. We don't know. We don't understand. We don't get this thing. It's either too good to be true or we can't understand. It doesn't make sense. 
Did someone steal his body? Have the authorities removed his body? What does this mean? You know, people can hear the Easter message, but not grasp that meaning for themselves without the Holy Spirit, without God working in their life to illuminate, to help them to understand, because things are spiritually discerned. They need to work the Spirit. But the first step is hearing the Word, isn't it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. John hears. And then he sees for himself. It says that John and Peter run to the tomb. Now, uh, for whatever reason, in a foot race, John was able to uh, best Peter just a little bit. He gets there first. He stops, though, at the edge of the tomb and merely glances in. Peter, impetuous Peter, uh, just runs right past John and dives into the tomb. This is what they see. First of all, they see a place of defeat. Looking into the matter, what will he discover when he goes to the tomb? John is the disciple who stayed closest to Jesus throughout his trials. He was in the courtyard or even closer in the uh, courtyard of um, Caiaphas during the uh, Jewish segment of the trial of Jesus. He stood at the foot of the cross and watched his beloved friend being killed. And it was from the cross that... Uh, Jesus said John should take care of uh, his mother. And he witnessed all these things. It was not an easy thing to go back to that place of defeat. How many times God calls us to come back to our worst defeat, that most raw or broken place, in order to take us beyond that, through it, into a place of victory. Doesn't mean it's always easy, but that's where John starts. And what he looks into for himself is a shocking discovery. First of all, there's some details here. Uh, the linen strips that were wrapped around Jesus' body by Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea on the Friday before are lying exactly as they have been wrapped and placed on the stone slab. Undisturbed except for the uh, separate piece, the head cloth, that was folded neatly on the side. None of those, none of that is evidence of a grave robbery, by the way. First of all, the uh, linens would have been very valuable, and any grave robber would have actually been more interested in the grave cloths than it would have been the body, would have taken them. They never would have taken time to fold them up neatly and put the head cloth by the side, and the body piece is undisturbed. You can't wrap up a body in a swaddling uh, cloth and then take the body out. You have to unwrap it. No grave robber would have taken the time to do that. And uh, this has not been disturbed. The linens are lying there exactly as they have been placed. Which means simply that at one point there was a body and then simply there wasn't a body in those claws anymore. It was as if the body had simply evaporated or been resurrected. Uh -huh. The verb that is used here actually uh, refers to the winding of the linens around the body. It's impossible to extract that from its wrappings without disturbing them and the burial spices that were placed in the wrapping folds. What they see is a confusing and conflicting uh, moment for them. It's called a crisis of faith. Step one is hearing the word. Step two is a crisis of faith. It's where we view the evidence, where we really try to figure out what's going on, and where we're under conviction, and no longer is it simply enough to believe because our parents did, or because somebody else did, or because somebody else said so, but where it becomes real for us as a person. And now let's look at what John said. It's necessary to look into this for yourself. Every individual needs to look into what Christ has done for him or herself. Can't ride on anyone else's coattails. We need to make that personal decision. Like John, we need to go 
and to look and to uh, consider what is taking place here. In verse um, verse 1, the very uh, first mention is made of someone seeing something, and it actually is Mary. <coughs> she, uh, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb, verse 1, and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. A little bit later, in verse 5, John himself arrives. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there. And this in the Greek is the word blepi. And it means to look at something. Mary went and she observed a fact. The stone was rolled away. Didn't know what to make of it. Ran went to talk to the disciples. What could this mean? John comes uh, and arrives at the tomb and he peers in and looks at the condition on the inside of the tomb. They're looking at, but they're, they're not really uh, going beyond a simply a cursory examination. Others consider what they saw. Verse 6, Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He bypasses John at the entrance. He goes inside the cave-like opening, and he saw the strips of linen lying there. In English, it's the same word in the Greek. It's a different word. It's the word theori. We get the word theory, or theorize, from it. And it means to consider it. Peter didn't stop at just merely looking at something. He is uh, allowing his mind to try to grapple with what he is seeing. Not coming up with any conclusions yet, but he is working through his mind. What could this mean? And then we see the next step. Finally, verse 8, the other disciple, we believe that to be John, who reached the tomb first, also went inside. You know, there's the stages. You hear the word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And that crisis of faith, where you grapple with what does this mean? Grapple with, that, do I need to make this decision? Am I willing to place my eternal trust in Christ? And then finally, the next step. He went inside. And then that wonderful <coughs> sentence. He saw and believed. Same English word, different Greek word. It's the Greek word idon, and it means seeing in the sense that he perceived. He understood. The light bulb has come on. He's seen the light. He's understood. He's grasped what it's all about. And the next logical step, he believed. In John's Gospel, as I have often told you, the noun faith in the Greek is never used. It is always the verb to believe. This, John says to his um, readers, this Gospel is written that you might believe, just as he did when he looked inside that tomb. After all, he says in the opening, the prologue of the Gospel, he says that uh, for those who believe and receive have the right to become children of God. And he knew that from firsthand experience. He, his eyes were opened and he understood. He got it. And John and was buried and is now alive, the living Son of God, the one true Savior and our Lord. And it is the testimony of one who saw that. Because Jesus is not an imposter, but is actually Lord because he reigns, because he is the living Son of God, fear can be exchanged for assurance and hope and conviction that endures. Not something that's here today and gone tomorrow, but something that will last you a lifetime. Tears can be exchanged for joy. And circumstances can never take away that joy. Well, they can make us sad. They can make us hurt. They, they can make us squirm. But it'll never take away our joy. 
crisis of belief can be exchanged for faith that includes a certainty and a purpose. And commitment can be made to let God build a better servant out of us. A commitment that endures year after year. And power becomes ours. Not just because of a historical event as true as it is. And as crucial as it is. And as proven as it is. And as powerful as it was. But when a person like John sees and believes and receives Christ as Savior, there is power. John wasn't finished when he saw and understood. He was only getting started. God would use him mightily for decades to come. And his ministry is still having an effect on us. There is a power that comes to us that enables us to obey God where the flesh would fight against it. There is power to change and become the people that we ought to be. There is power to love those around us even if they're messed up and power to get back up after being pummeled by waves of affliction. Power to wield the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God and the shield of faith to extinguish the devil's fiery darts, power to pray for loved ones and friends and strangers that they might also, like John, see and believe. Not just look at, not just hear, not even just theorize about, but understand who Christ is. And it is that power of God I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. That power. And we need that power for our life. It's been said that an electric cord, think of an extension cord, an electric cord is weak and flimsy. But when you plug it into the socket, it connects to all the voltage of the electric company. And so it is with our lives. Mostly pretty weak and flimsy. But there's a power when we're connected to Christ. Sinners by birth and by choice, he came into the world to save us and forgive us that we might stand and have a right standing in him. He saves, Jesus saves people, not by our own righteousness, but by his mercy and his righteousness imputed to us. By grace that you are saved through faith and only in Christ. And it is he who justifies and brings hope and power for all who see and believe. So come, listen to what we say. Invite others to come and hear the word of God. And to take a look at and to then consider Invite them to keep coming until the Holy Spirit has saturated their heart and convicted them to the point that they're able to perceive, to understand. Go in His power, the power of the risen Christ, and live for Him. Lord God, thank You for Your word.